it's time to take a break from the revolution that's going on over at IDW and take a look at Eternia where there's a rivalry going on that many 80s fans have been debating over for decades. Welcome to Star Joes. I'm your host Ryan and today we're going to be covering He-Man Thundercats number one from DC Comics. It's written by Rob David and Lloyd Goldfein, and it's drawn by Freddie Williams II. And this is really, like I said at the very beginning, it's a debate over a lot of 80s fans that are out there. Which is better, Masters of the Universe or Thundercats? Now, personally, I love both of them. There are times where I love Masters of the Universe a little bit more than Thundercats, and there's times I love Thundercats a little bit more than Masters of the Universe. It really kind of depends on what is going on at that time. When the Thundercats had their new cartoon out, I was... 100% in favor of Thundercats. When DC Comics had their He-Man and the Masters of the Universe comic series going on, I was 100% on board with He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. So when you bring these two characters together, these two properties together, I'm all in to check it out. Uh, and I have to say, this comic didn't disappoint. I really enjoyed it overall. Uh, now, it does have a lot of fan service, so if you're a fan of Thundercats or you're a fan of Masters of the Universe or if you're like me and you're a fan of both of them, then you're going to really enjoy this comic because there's a lot of nods to all the different characters, the different locations, and really the writing team here really brings it all together. And Freddie Williams II really makes sure that he puts a lot of those characters that you're going to know, especially if you're a big fan of these, he puts them in the backgrounds in different places. So this way it totally plays into that nostalgia. It totally plays into that fan service there. And fan service has gotten a bad rap. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Yes, when it's forced, it comes across as a bad thing because you're just placing things just so this way, hey, I can get that money grab and everything else. This is not one of those uh, comic issues. This is one where it really is, these characters are really put in there for you to enjoy them, for you to recognize them, and for you to see that this is a story for the fans out there. Now, the only thing I will say when it comes to the art is Freddie Williams II's art is good, and there's a lot of people that absolutely love his style. However, his style has changed over the years, and right about the time he was doing Justice Society of America for DC is when his art started following the pattern that he's following now. I can't say I'm a big fan of his art currently. It's kind of like how it is for me with uh, Howard Chaikin or John Romita Jr. I liked their art styles back when they first started. I'm not such a big fan of their art style now. Same thing when it comes to Freddie Williams II. I really loved his art style when he first started. His art style right now is not my favorite, but art is subjective, so what I don't like, you might like. For me, when it came to this issue, he drew the lion and the Thundercats and Mumra and Skeletor and all these characters really, really well that were not human characters, but just like humanoid characters. When he actually went to draw the human characters like He-Man or Man-at-Arms or Tila, they came across as kind of looking a bit like a claymation figure, and that kind of distracted me a bit. Uh, just there was something off, and I think some of it honestly was just how the hair was drawn. It, it like I said, had this clay look to it rather than having a hair look to it. So uh, it was just distracting for me. Um, the art also gets a little bit muddied with some of the coloring and everything else, so um, it, it just kind of detracts from the details that are actually in the scene. Now, when it came to the story itself, um, there, again, a couple issues that I had uh, during the, the story itself. At the very beginning of the issue, we see Mumra going up against Lino, and it's just this awesome full-page splash of Lino just slashing into Mumra with the Sword of Omens. And when we flip the page over, we see Mumra in his mummified form uh, with the wound walking into his temple, and we don't really understand how he got away from Lion-O. Uh, I don't need everything explained, and I'm sure I could come up with some way he escaped. But it just didn't make a lot of sense to go from this epic battle on one page to the next page he escaped with what essentially was close to being a mortal wound. But again, it kind of helped move the story along, so I totally understand it. I just don't understand how this happened. Um, but I guess with a lot of the 80s cartoons back then, you didn't really understand how the bad guys got out of the pickle that they were in, or the good guys for that matter. Um, now, 
when it came to later on in the story, there is a moment in there, and I'm not going to spoil it for anyone. You need to go out and read the issue. But there's a moment where a character suffers what would be a mortal wound. And I really don't know how this character survived. Um, even with some of the things that we know about this character and some of the things that are going on, I don't understand how this character could possibly survive this at all. Now, I will say, as the series goes on, this mortal wound that I'm referring to could play a factor in the storyline, and that would actually be pretty cool, and it'd be an interesting twist of something that they have to face together and solve. But for this issue, I was like, I don't really understand what just happened, and I don't understand how things happened the way they did. Uh, if you want to know kind of what I mean, I have no problem mentioning it in the comments below. I just don't want to spoil it for anyone that might be watching this video and hasn't read the issue yet and wants to. So like I said, with this comic issue, I really did enjoy it. I'm looking forward to the upcoming issues. There were a few things when it came to the art and a few things when it came to the story that kind of took me out of it a little bit. But as a fan, man, you could not ask for a better start to a series. So I am going to give this a rating of a hero and a half shell. Like I said, there was a few things in the story that I would have liked to have been better explained. And when it came to the art, it wasn't exactly my favorite. But again, art is subjective. You might absolutely love it. So when it comes to He-Man and Thundercats issue number one, did you read it? What did you think about it? Let me know in the comments below. Also, let me know who is your favorite Thundercat and who is your favorite Masters of the Universe character. I'd love to hear that. I always love hearing people's favorite things from these toy properties. If you like this video, please hit that like button below. And if you want to see more of these videos, please hit that subscribe button below as well. I'm looking forward to bringing you more of these comic reviews. Uh, next time, we'll probably be delving right back into Revolution, so stay tuned for that. Uh, but with that, we'll go ahead and close this episode by saying the Force will be with you because knowing us is half the battle. Take care, guys.